Hello, members. Welcome and good evening to everybody. I hope that you're somewhere warm and comfortable tonight to enjoy three delicious Malbecs with me. Um, I have to be honest, this is an event I've personally been looking forward to for a while um, and sad at the same time. This is my last focus on event at the Wine Society. So I'm going to try and squeeze in as much possible Malbec content as we can and really celebrate a great variety that I think needs a lot more attention um, and a lot more respect. Malbec needs respect. So um, I'm Anna Spooner from the Tastings team. Welcome to everyone and welcome as well behind the scenes to Mahesh who is helping out tonight and will be wonderful as always. He always reminds me, please can you uh, make sure that if you're using the chat tonight, select all uh everyone rather than panelists and attendees as many of you already have and that means that you can um see everybody's messages i hope that some of you have all three wines tonight but i appreciate they were quite pricey so hopefully you still have some delicious malbec in your glass let us know if you're drinking something else tonight and how it's tasting um also there is a q and a I'm speaking quickly because I'm going to try and get time to answer as many questions as possible. Uh, Mahesh will help me behind the scenes. So if you put those questions into the Q&A, it's much easier for us both to see them. And that way we can manage them better and make sure we get through as many as possible. You'll notice I'm in a different background tonight as well. I'm in London. Uh, so doing the event from my sister's house. She's kindly gone out whilst I drink the Malbecs or taste the Malbecs, but she's excited to drink them later. So apologies if if there is any noise but I'm in the quietest spot in the flat so fingers crossed. So without any further uh, to-dos I think it's probably time we got started. Um, if you didn't receive my email just to confirm if you are tasting the wines tonight uh, we're going to taste the vine out first which is the oldest wine um, the reason we're doing that should become apparent, but we're going to taste the other two as a pair. I do recommend, if you haven't already, to have a glass of water the re between wines one and then two and three, if you have all of them. The reason is um, the viner is beautifully sort of strong and, and flavorful, but is very different in contrast to the second two wines being so much older. So I'm kind of going to treat the event as one wine and then a pair afterwards. But we're going to take you on a journey through Malbec before then. So I want to put it in context. Argentinian Malbec uh, is a big deal, is how I would describe it. So I wanted to just give you a tiny bit of context on how it compares to other flagship wines. And this is a great stat from um, the Wines of Argentina's website. And if you haven't visited that website, I do encourage you to do so. There are certain grape varieties that are the calling card of certain countries or regions. So here they've compared it to Zinfandel in the US, where uh, it's really the main, you know, there's nowhere else that grows Zinfandel. There is there is uh, Primitivo, but uh, nowhere that grows Zinfandel like the US. Pinotage from South Africa, Carmenere from Chile and Syrah from Australia. And that's probably the one I would argue is is a bit of a red herring because you do get Shiraz and Syrah grown around the world. But what you can see from this is, um, and don't worry, I can send the slides, but the main thing that I would say really is huge amounts of Argentinian Malbec are exported. Six, oh, pardon me. 61% of Argentinian Malbec is exported. That is an enormous number compared to other countries. Only 4% of South African Pinotage was exported. Um, there's also a huge price hike compared to other varieties, which I find absolutely fascinating. So compared to other varieties in Argentina, Malbec commands 22% higher price than the other grapes. It's 17% of the surface area, and that's increased from 10.5%. And, and I know these are slightly older stats. If you can't see, don't worry too much. But in 2006, it was around 10% of the uh, total surface area of the production of grapes, and it's now up at 17. Uh, I'll explain a little bit about why I think that is in a moment, but I do think it's a really unique proposition, Argentinian Malbec. Um, Laura, Dr. Laura Catena, who I'll probably reference several times through this call, who's sort of the 
um, the queen, the godmother, whatever you want to call it, the, the kooky aunt, the genius of, of a lot of Malbec and uh, what it means to Argentina now. Uh, somebody, some journalists years ago asked her, what's next after, the, after Malbec in Argentina? And for a while she tried to have an answer. And then uh, she said, does, sort of, does there need to be anything next? You wouldn't go to a Burgundian producer and say, what's next after Pinot Noir? So I love that. I think that's a really fair point. But let's talk about the history of Argentinian Malbec. And to understand the history of Argentinian Malbec, I haven't lost my mind. <laughs> we need to understand France. So Malbec is a French grape variety. And in fact, it was really important in the Roman times. There's evidence of it being important in the Roman times. But in particular, it was also important on the western parts of France. So Cahors, which is in this dark green area in southwest, is still um, probably the heartland of French Malbec. Uh, it's actually a law in Cahors. If you label it Cahors, it has to be minimum 70%. And they use the term, it's not actually the original term, but they use the term now Co. So C over the hat, T. Um, some suggest that could have been its original name. Um, there's some evidence to show that. But actually in Cahors, it used to be called Uxawa, which is very bizarre because that's a Burgundian name. Uh, I don't believe that it was a popular grape of Burgundy. Um, there is some evidence it was grown there, but uh, the other places that it's been particularly popular are on the right bank of Bordeaux. I'm going to go into more detail on that in a minute because it's very interesting, but the right bank of Bordeaux was called Pressac. And then, oh, sorry, pardon me. And then it was also permitted in the Loire, uh, not permitted, but grown regularly in the Loire Valley. And um, the reason I mention this whole entire area is one of the reasons it was so popular as a grape of Western France and the Aquitaine region. And when Eleanor of Aquitaine married um, Henry of England, a lot of these grape varieties became popular in England. So we were also growing and drinking an awful lot, not growing, sorry, consuming a lot of Western French grown Malbec in the UK. So how come now in the Loire, it's all Cab Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon, Gamay? How come in um, Bordeaux, it's Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot? How come in Southwest France, there's a lot more grape variety? Well, the problem really is down to colure and uh, sensitivity to cool temperatures. So it all kind of went wrong in France after... Um, well, the, the grape variety Malbec itself, Coulure is when there is essentially no fertilization and therefore no grape within the flower. There is another, um, there is another disease, Milorandage, which sometimes gets confused with, not a disease. Um, what's the word I mean? Sorry, that's very annoying. Let me try and turn that off. Um, it's it, basically what happens with Malbec is when it's too cold, so brought on by the cool weather, sometimes the flowers don't fruit set properly and therefore you get fewer berries per, bu per bunch, which can be great for quality. But in Southwest France in the 1800s, this was not good for quantity, which is what people wanted. So La Dr. Laura Catena has done lots of research and she actually suggests that Malbec was more popular than Cabernet Sauvignon in the 18th and 19th century in Bordeaux, which is just really wild to imagine. Um, but they believe that Malbec came to Argentina in the 1800s by a gentleman, traveled with a gentleman called Michel Apuget. He was an agronomist, founded a very cool uh, agronomy, uh, uh, agronomic, is that how you say it? Agronomy school in Mendoza. So in the 1800s, Malbec is suddenly planted in Argentina. And um, what's interesting is as France was having a very cold spell and having this very tough time, getting its Malbec to ripen and ripen in good enough quantities when people were really looking for quantity over quality. Concurrently, there's a very different story going on in Argentina. Essentially, they're, they're planting, they're making nurseries. Um, they might not be perhaps, uh, you know, thriving uh, on Malbec, but they're certainly growing it. And the French had basically a, a decade of very cold weather and poor, poor wines. So they start to replace their Malbec that's really not great with Merlot. 
in Bordeaux because the Merlot does the same job as the Malbec. They've both got very soft tannins, kind of like a fleshy mid palate. And they also found that it ripened, Merlot ripened earlier than Cabernet Sauvignon. So why that's important is if you're a winemaker, you don't want your two key blending grapes to ripen at the same time. It's bad for logistics. It's sorry, that's really annoying. It's bad for logistics. It's um, it's just bad across the board. So what you really want to do, there we go. I think I've turned it off. Perfect. Uh, so what you really want to do is you want to create uh, a situation where you have your Merlot ripening first and your Cabernet Sauvignon afterwards. Final straw is a frost in 1956. Malbec had a disaster in Bordeaux. Let's rip everything out. Meanwhile, um, in Argentina, Malbec's having a bit of a weird time as well. It's sort of sat in waiting, but we've got this amazing selection of pre phylloxera cuttings that are just doing their thing. Really unusually, Argentina has a strange version of phylloxera that not many people know about, and only about 90%, uh, sorry, only about 10% are, are grafted, the, the quality Malbec vines. About 90% can be ungrafted. There's also a lot of massile selection, so we'll go on to that in a minute, but basically taking really good plants and making another one out of them. Not a clone per se, so they're not, um, but they're, they're sort of taking the best bits of plants. So now France is getting rid of Malbec and Argentina is slowly but surely trying, not trying, but accidentally building the best bank of Argent, um, sorry, the best bank of Malbec plants in the world. In France, they're just looking for high yields. So they want berries, lots of them, lots of juice. Yep, that's great. We'll repeat that plant. That's not happening in Argentina. In the 60s and 70s, actually, people started pulling up Argentinian Malbec because it was too good quality and there wasn't enough juice and it was so low yielding. Luckily for us, many nurseries just like the Catena, uh, Nicola Catena and others actually started to focus on quality Malbec. And they said, oh, hold on, we have this amazing plant material here. Let's do something with it. And again, we don't have time for me to tell you all about the entire uh, article, but the real turning point of Argentinian Malbec, which I must mention is grown all over the country, but we'll mainly focus on Mendoza today. Um, this was a, a quote from a Wall Street Journal article that came out in 1999, which a lot of people say was the turning point. Um, a genuine article basically saying that they weren't very familiar with Malbec and they taste some Malbecs. And one of the wines that they taste is Cabas de Vinet. Now, Cabas de Vinet is actually a blend. So it's got some other Bordeaux varietals in it, but it's Malbec dom dominant. And this is the new dawn. Suddenly people were aware and particularly Americans were aware about this new grape variety. And there were really two pioneers at the time. Nicola Catena, who I've mentioned, who's now... Uh, daughters Laura and Adriana are in charge, and Weinert, which is our first wine, hence my choice to put it first, headed um, originally by a Brazilian gentleman called Dom Bernardo C. Weinert, and now run by, uh, very much managed and run by his daughter Aduna, and I'm sure most of you will know both of those parties. Um, so let's, I'll save that for later. Let's go on to our Bodegas Cava and Cavas Vinat wine. Uh, so very historical producer, naturally. Based in Mendoza, this building was built in the 1890s by a Spanish family, and it was a winery, but that fell into uh, disrepute. So the Vinat brand was started in 1975. Um, Bra Brazilian gentleman, as I mentioned, businessman, but with a German heritage. And what he wanted to do that was very different is he wanted to create, create these high quality classic wines. And essentially, Nicola Catena um, and Vinat, so the Catena family and the Vinat family, were trying to pitch premium Argentinian wines at a time that the world didn't really want to hear about it. But uh, the Vinat brand focused on these big, high quality French oak casks. And that was very trendy back then. But um, the world, should we say, decided, oh, no, we love Aussie Shiraz. We like this. We like that. We love Burgundy. We love Bordeaux. So let's go to smaller barrels. So 225 or 228 litres were very trendy. Vinet throughout this whole period said no. They said, we're going to stick with this old barrel aging. 
and long barrel aging. And I would probably argue that up there, there aren't many producers in the world that still age their wines like this, if at all. There are a few, um, yeah, I mean, I probably actually couldn't name a single one who have such a steadfast approach to old barrel aging. The, um, the barrels are very old and they don't impart flavor. They just massage the tannins. So um, this is from the 2020-12 vintage. The vines that go into this are from 60 to 100 years old. And they are based in a region of Lujan de, de, de Cuyo, which is where their winemaker, Hubert Weber, says the absolute best Malbec comes from, as well as a bit from a parcel in the Maipu. And I'll show you where that is in, in Mendoza in a minute, but I do just want to tell you about the producer and its wine. Um, the 2012 vintage had hydric stress. So one thing that Mendoza relies on, uh, relies on is snowfall or snow melt water from the Andes. And there was not much snowfall that year. And so there's a lot more concentration in the 2012. Um, what they do is they ferment quite quickly. And then this wine spent nine years in a big oak barrel. How can you have a wine that has been aged in barrel for nine years and is less than 16 pounds? This always blows my mind about the vine out wines. Um, the barrels, as I mentioned, are large. And for this wine, they ranged from around 2,000 to 9,000 litres. So uh, as I said, not imparting flavour, not imparting as much oxygen as a smaller barrel either, but this sort of slow and steady maturation. So... Let me stop sharing that so I can see some, some chat comments. Um, if you are tasting along with this wine tonight and you've never tasted a vine at wine before, let me know what you think. Um, it's sort of um, earthy. It's It's got something kind of woody, but not woody. And I'm not meaning that from like oak wood. It's more like forest. So walking through a forest leathery tobacco but for me it's got this touch of star anise that I think is absolutely amazing they don't specialize in Malbec they're really good with a lot of great varieties whereas I would say some producers are very Malbec focused but this is an incredible um an incredible example of their Malbec um it's it's sort of um it's got a slightly floral character, but for me, it's more about that tertiary note. So that forest floor, tobacco leaf. Um, yeah, star anise is really getting me. I can't really put my finger on it. Is anybody else tasting along? I'm going to have a try. Mm. Mm. I mean, it's still got such freshness. It's really vibrant. The acidity is singing. It's got this lovely um, lift to it that means that it's strangely refreshing for a wine of its age. Um, and that is down to the quality of the production of the fruit that they get in. You can't retain that level of acidity without excellent quality fruit. It's got some nice kind of crushed strawberries, um, which is amazing. Like strawberries and black pepper sort of thing. But the tannins are silky smooth with a peppery spice on the end, which I think is really what the vine out wines go for. Um, it looks like a few people have, have tasted Malbecs from vine out before. Um, someone's got a 1994 Tonnel 111. Um, Jason's also got the Tonnel 111. I want, are you tasting that tonight, Jason? I'd be keen to know. David said terrific value. Uh, John said he tasted this at the Wine Society tasting at Chichester on Friday. Yes, it's part of our Southern Hemisphere's um, uh, release um, or New Horizons, it's called. Sorry, because we have got um, we have got America in there as well. But I think the amazing thing um, for me about this wine is there's very few, very few New Horizon wines that have got 10 plus years of age and still taste like this. Um, John and Jane have said totally agree about the freshness for a 10 year old wine. It's stonking. Um, the other thing is I was looking up some other reviews on this wine to see where people put it. And what I find interesting is the reviewers who also um, do something quite clever, which is uh, you leave an old wine open and to try and work out how long it's going to last. It's not a, a fail safe rule, but if you leave an old wine open or if you decant it, sometimes um, it will fall off a cliff. 
And that really means you should be drinking up whatever you've got left in that case. A lot of people said that the amazing thing about the vinyl wines is they just never seem to fall off. You can you can go back to it four hours later and it still tastes incredible. Um, and so that does stand testament to the longevity of this wine. Danuta said hint of licorice. Yeah, I do get that. That's that's that star and each licorice thing I've got. Definitely. Um, it's a serious, serious wine for an unserious or that's not a word, but I don't care excellent price point made by a beautiful historic producer in a great variety that is quite frankly underappreciated so there's, there were very few other wines I could have kicked off tonight with um the Vinerts and the Catenas set the scene for the world of Malbec as we know it so oh pardon me um bear with me I uh I've had a couple of questions but I won't um I won't address those just yet because I think they're good ones for the end because they're nice and juicy. Um, but I'll just quickly go back to the slide we had a moment ago. Uh, just to give you a little more of an overview on the surface area of Malbec. Again, I will send this round. But what I really wanted to show you more than anything is the growth of Malbec, even from 2006. That was the main thing I wanted to say on this piece. It is an increasingly popular grape variety. And yes, some of that is for the mass and the easy drinking and the sort of simple, cheap and cheerful, of which Malbec can produce. However, there is also a massive trend towards the fine wines of Malbec. And I think that's where things start to get incredibly interesting. So I want to talk a little bit about the clones that they're using in Argentina. The reality is that lots of people just don't know what the clones are. What's, what sets Argentina apart from France is this very historic, old, traditionally farmed uh, mentality around Malbec. And thank goodness it wasn't all scrubbed up. But easily vines can be 60 to 90 years old, like we've just had. Um, but there is definitely an appreciation of these old vines. Yes, clones were originally brought in from France, but the evolution um, of over, you know, 150 years has got them to this point because they have preserved. And a lot of that is through that mention I had earlier of massal selection. Because there wasn't the technology to take cuttings and produce clonal material, actually massal selection, so just picking your best plants and breeding from them and seeing what happens uh, was really important. And there are um, a few nurseries, one of which the Katena Institute, which is a research facility run by the Katena family. They um, have a whole, they have a row of 100, well, sorry, several rows, 135 rows of different cuttings that have been planted. And they test them all and understand them. And yields can range from anything from one kilogram of fruit to a plant, from five kilograms of fruit to a plant. So that really shows the different yields. And if you're not familiar with yields and quality, there's an argument, it's not always true, but there's an argument that high yielding fruit by yield, by if the plant produces lots and lots of fruit, the concentration of that fruit won't be as much. So generally, there are some exceptions that are amazing, but generally really high yielding plants will tend not to have the good quality. Um, one kilograms to five kilograms is a really good range, but that just shows the difference five times as much. But really, the key thing about Argentina is that diversity is important. And actually, unlike Burgundy, where you might say, oh, well, I planted to this clone or, you know, these are all the Dijon clones and this is this clone or etc. Actually, the irony is clonal material isn't as much of a point around Malbec. Um but there are a few that are generally good. So if you hear, uh, if you were to replant a vineyard and you didn't have all of your lovely old materials, if a newcomer wasn't so lucky, then they would look for, there's sort of three clones that are known for very good quality. 80, glamorous name. 105, also a glamorous name. Um, and the uh, Gualtelari, which is the name of a little area, vineyard area. Um, and they're all really, really good for quality. One more fascinating fact about clones before we move on to our pair and, and talking a bit more about the regions and terroir of Argentinian Malbec is um, there was a study in 2011 done by U at UC Davis studying five French Malbec clones and five Argentinian Malbec clones. 
And overall, the Argentine Malbec did produce significantly lower yields um, than the French and like significantly, significantly lower. So it was 22 kilos versus 60 kilos on, I think that must be, I'm trying to think, I'm trying to think what square. Anyway, three times as much. So five French Malbec clones, five Argentinian Malbec clones, three times the difference of yields, just French versus Argentinian. Um, but not only that, they also did studies to look at what the flavor compounds were. And I won't go too technical, but um, they had different anthocyanins on the skin. So the Argentinian clones had, uh, oh gosh, the word's horrible to say, dehydroxylated anthocyanins. So those are the sort of things that affect tannins. It's why sometimes you can taste uh, putting words in the mouth here because this isn't this isn't a fact, but different anthocyanins will affect your tannin structure as well as other things. But you can often find that French Malbecs can taste a little bit more rough and ready. And the Argentinian ones have this lovely, incredible, smooth um, tannin structure. Now, don't get me wrong. Some of the French ones are interesting because of that tannin structure. So it's not a one size fits all, but it does definitely show you the difference and also probably goes some way to explaining why Argentina's got 40,000 hectares of Malbec and France has 6,000. It comes down to terroir. So let's talk terroir. Um, we probably should. <laughs> um, it's such a, um, oh, we've just had a good recommendation. Those who have the Zaha and the Tejo recommend food with them. They go well with Brussels pate and cheese. Uh, that sounds delicious. I haven't had my uh, dinner yet. I didn't have a choice on what we we're having for dinner, but I have to say, um, you don't just have to have Malbec with steak, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, if we get a chance, I'll try and give you some other ideas. Certainly, um, I'm sure many of you will be able to give other members some hints and tips as well in the chat. But terroir in, terroir in Argentina, it's a French word and it's been embraced by the Argentinians. Malbec is an interesting variety in that it has incredibly deep roots. It's quite good at surviving in lots of different climates and circumstances other than cold. So if you leave cold and frost out, frost being the main problem and uh, this colliure I mentioned, it can survive sandy soils, rocky soils. Um, and because of that, again, there's a lot more um, development in the types of wine that you can make. Argentinian Malbec generally does have this good texture. But there are, there are definitely different flavors and different aromas that can come from the different regions. So if I just nip back to my map, because I have a horrible feeling I've put it in the wrong place. We go back to the map and I'll just literally do a couple of, of um, other regions outside Mendoza where Malbec is thriving at the moment. So Salta, right up here in the north, should be very, uh, for anyone who didn't watch my session intro to Alg Argentina last week, this should be very warm. We're getting close to the equator, but it is a high altitude desert. Because of this high altitude, it stays cool enough, but not too cold for the Malbec. But the UV, some of the highest altitude vineyards in the world, the UV exposure here is so intense that the wine takes on this almost unbelievable quality but very very different style some people are still trying to get their heads around it but it's sort of when I say jammy I really don't mean that in a bad way it's sort of like nectar syrupy dense intense and you might think oh but surely that's going to have no acid no because it's so high up and it has this amazing altitude it retains the acidity so if you haven't tried a Malbec from Salta they are quite amazing and then if we go right down to the bottom to Patagonia, we can go to the flip side. It's cool for different reasons, but here it, it's cool because it's further away from the equator. And here it doesn't have the um, sunlight UV intensity. So that kind of like thick, dense texture that comes from the grape skins, essentially putting a sunscreen on, doesn't happen. So instead you get this more spicy, more herbaceous, more, yeah, kind of, um, uh, dried herbs, that kind of character. So incredibly different style. But we're all here 
because we've probably got a Malbec from Mendoza and some of you might have three. So let's talk about Mendoza, which is where this really starts to shine. And I apologize for putting that in such a silly order. So Mendoza is amazing. You have such different altitudes here and altitude is so important in, in Argentinian wine. In Mendoza, the really low ones, and I mean really low comparatively, can be at about 500 meters. 940 is about the middle, around the thousand mark is where a lot of the good quality stuff is. And then you can go all the way up to 1,500 meters above sea level. The difference in intensity of sunlight between, nine, like, let's call it 1,000 and 1,500, there or thereabouts, is 30% increase on that UV ultraviolet intensity. And what that does for your grape skins, I've already mentioned they sort of put on a jacket or a sun cream. And those anthocyanins that we spoke about in the skins start to increase. The polyphenols increase. So you start to get wines that have slightly higher color concentration, slightly different tannic structure, it's mostly higher, but just different. Um, but because every, I have I remembered this right, every 600 ish meters above sea level 600 to 700 depending on where you are on, towards the equator you reduce by one degree celsius so you've got this incredible intensity of sunlight in mendoza low atmosphere high uv concentration high uv rays getting in creating that that um creating that lovely jacket around your very small grapes and you have cooling influence as well so let's talk quickly about a couple of the regions. And I do apologize profusely about this map. It's not that good looking. Um, in fact, it's borderline, borderline to be ignored. Um, I've got some other ones in a moment that are a little bit better. Um, in fact, let's just go back to this before that gives everyone a headache. <laughs> but uh, so we'll quickly touch on a couple of regions. We'll taste some wines and then we'll do some other regions afterwards, because I think that's probably the best way of doing it. So we've mentioned already the Lujan de Cuyo area, which is where our vine out was from. Um, there are two special regions I wanted to mention that kind of go hand in hand here. Uh, so there's the Vistalpa and uh, Las Compuetas. They only make up 0.6% of Mendoza's overall production. So it's super, super tiny. And they are on the far western zone. And why is that important? Well, you get very alluvial soils from the Andes. And you can literally see the Andes here. And you can see the rivers coming down through. So the alluvial sandy soils coming from the rivers of the Andes. But you have the mountains for incredibly cool breezes, as well as being at 1,000 metres above sea level. So you have very firm acidity, this real structure and body here. Lots of dark fruits, cloves, peppers. And I think we picked up on that in our first wine, that clove pepper. I just talked about that pepper tannin spice. Lujan de Cuyo tends to be less sort of aromatic and floral and ethereal as the wines of the Uco Valley that we're about to taste. It's much more about this structure, this acidity. It's why these wines that we just tasted, the vine out wines, last. I mentioned this acidity, and that is why this region has great structure. Um, so it's it's kind of a bit of a godsend. And, and I totally appreciate that for Vinert, it makes a lot of sense to be in that part of Argentina. But let's go to the Uco Valley. Um, and the Uco, I'll show you where that is quickly as well. Valle de Uco, the pink bit here on the map. Um, so Valle de Uco, we're going to taste our first wine is from the um, Paraje Altimera, sometimes just called Paraje sometimes called Altimera, <laughs> um, but it's Paraje Altimera. I think mostly you just call it Altimera if you were being lazy. Soils here are really diverse. So um, it's this little IG red section. I'm going to try and get another map. This is much better. So um, I stole this from Decanter, so I hope they won't mind, but it's actually quite hard to find really good quality maps breaking down the Uco Valley. So the Paraja Altimera is this section in number two. So we've got one wine that is from the region as a whole. It is from a specific vineyard within it, but it advertises itself as Paraja Altimera, and that's our first wine. And then we have a second wine, which is very specifically from La Consulta. So that's the Tejo. Um, and I'll talk about why it's different. But the main reason about Paraja Altimera 
uh, Altimira is that it's um, very diverse. So you have floral patches on the sandy soils. You have this minerality when it gets stony. And then with the rocky areas, this very intense dark fruit. And sometimes you can have all those sorts of stones in one vineyard, which is quite incredible. Um, the percentage of Mendoza vineyards here is 0.8% again. But one thing about this is they have lovely access to water again, not quite the same amount of access as we had up here in which we can't really see just off my screen um, in Lucien de Cuyo. But we do still have some water access coming down here. The altitude is very similar, 1,000 to 1,100 around here. And what was interesting about Paraje Altimira is that it was actually the first GI. So it's the first geographically indicated um, or identified, I should say, region in Argentina. And there was a big fight to get that sorted because the wines are very special. Um, so it sits within the uh, Tunuyan province, I would say, uh, which is what you can see here, which is within the larger area of the Uco Valley, but it very much has its own special subsection. And if I was to say there's a calling card, a calling card, a call, like a, a name or a, a style to give um, uh, of the Altimera, Altimera region, maybe elegance and tension. Um, I've heard people say it's it's where they make the Pinot Noir style Malbecs, but I just think that's an absolutely absurd statement. Malbec doesn't taste anything like Pinot Noir, nor should it. Um, but I understand the sentiment in that it's where the kind of that very ethereal, that very, um, it's the wine Mahesh chose for the evening as well, I should say. It's very ethereal. Um, it's kind of, kind of got this elegance of touch. Um, and some amazing old vines in this region, 100 years easily, third, fourth, fifth generation farmers, same family. So it's very historic as well. So let's taste our wine number two. I think we should. Um, this producer is not on this because they are quite a small producer who make these two wines. There are some bigger brands you can see here. Members probably most familiar with Zuccardi, um, I would say. But overall, it's a small region. You can see there's not many players. Uh, it's got the good access to water, but the low rainfall. And it's kind of in at the base of the Andes Mountains, but still at this incredible altitude, which I will be honest, I don't think this document shows you well enough, the um, incredible altitude of these wines. So I'm going to taste one and then quickly move into the other on purpose because it's nice to taste them side by side. But what they both share is, is the... Oh, uh, this is the view of it, which just looks amazing. What they both share is, is they're from the same winemaking base and family. So um, Alejandro Sejanovic um, and He Mausbash, uh, they own a project called Malbec 55. And they basically are, I actually don't know where the name comes from. I've never really thought about that. But what they do is they look for these single vineyard sites, these small sites, and they have an incredible attention to detail about making these sites sing. So Zaha is the name of this wine, our first wine. And the vineyard is called Toko. So they do put the vineyard underneath. Zaha means heart in Mendoza, um, Mendoza native language, which is lovely. This is 90% Malbec, 8% Cabernet Franc, and 2% Petit Verdot. I say that with a raised intonation in my voice because Cabernet Franc is a, is a great variety that I think helps when you're going for that kind of ethereal, uh, light style of touch, sophisticated elegance. I think Cabernet Franc can do that beautifully. Um, the age of these vines are young in the world of, uh, of the Malbec 55's endeavours and of the region. Um, these are only 15 years old, but actually that's when they start hitting kind of their first good peak. Um, the altitude I've already mentioned, so we're actually well over 1,000 here. Harvested by hand for two weeks. Um, they, what I find amazing is Alejandro is the winemaker and he picks tiny little plots and he will pick the plots when they're ready. He won't say, let's pick the whole vineyard. And sometimes he'll co-ferment a couple of grapes together. Sometimes he'll co-ferment this row and this row. But at the end of the two weeks, he will have 20, 15, 20 mini wines at the end of harvest micro vinified so he'll put like a little a little bit of each and anywhere each year between 20 and 60 percent will be whole cluster on this wine so it brings this lovely freshness slow manual manual slow manual gradual um fermentation so what i mean by that is 
he uh, they won't let the temperature get too high and things speed up. So they'll do it nice and slowly, try and chill it where they can. And manual punch downs. So literally when you see people with the plunger um, to not over extract so that you don't get too much tannin here. They want to preserve delicacy and then they age them all separately and then they blend them back together. And they aged the whole wine in French oak for 12 months and only 10% of that is new. So for me, this is far more floral. Please, please, please. I've just seen somebody say one's opening more than the other. Please swirl them. Oh, the double swirl. It's dangerous with Malbec is high colored variety, but please do swirl. You should actually be able to tell slightly the difference of color of these wines. Yeah, a touch. The first one is lighter. Um, but please, if you're tasting a lot of swell, 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 it does need to open up. That's why I mentioned in the email, pouring these in advance is definitely recommended. I will let you into a secret. I wanted to share Zaha with my sister last night. So I did actually open it last night. <laughs> it smells amazing. Uh, we had a little glass last night uh, for me to say thank you for her for having me. So it's for me, really violet. It's It's got this really soft rose thing as well, not in a sweet, disgusting sort of... Um, you know, potpourri way. It's not like that at all. It's lovely flowers, fresh flowers, slightly mineral. And actually mine was more mineral last night. I got um, a real kind of graphite thing going on, but lovely freshness, red, blue, blue fruit here in particular, not too black, a little bit of current, but more blue. Um, somebody said goes really well with rolled breast of lamb. Oh, I bet. Um, very good. Um, Let's have a taste. The nice thing about this one I've mentioned, freshness, beautiful aromas. This is the, didn't want to say it, but the Burgundian way. Um, it's not, It's. It, it, I think that would be mad to say that, but it's lovely. Mm. Mm. Wow. So the tannins here are actually for me lower than the first wine, even though this wine is younger. You can really see that they haven't extracted the tannins in the same way as the vine out wine. It's got this kind of like um, velvety, but quite tight velvet feeling on the palate, which is not something that every Malbec drinker would be expecting. So this is not the wine that you want to serve to friends and say, here's your big hearty Malbec. It's not really like that. It's still very blue fruited, amazing fresh acidity, which I think is gorgeous. And it's definitely on that lighter style. Um, I love that wine. Mahesh, I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> um, yeah, he said before, he said, I'm going to, uh, he said, I had the Zaha already. It was delicious. He's supposed to taste along during the event, but I don't blame him. He was off work today. So I think he had it last night as well. Um, so that's the Zaha. Let's talk about the Tejo and then I'll talk about why it, why it matters so much. Two wines grown so close together. Um, so the Tejo, Tejo, the vintage is slightly different. So it's 2018, um, but the same pair of the same pair, the same company, Malbec 55. Um, this one has an average vine age of 80 years and Tomal actually means ancient. So um, what is it? Tejo. No, te Tomal means ancient. So it's literally ancient vineyard. And Tejo means blood of the earth. Just going to check. I think it's what. Yes, good, good, good. Um, the reason they say blood of the earth is because of those amazing sprawling vine um, vines, roots that Malbec has. And that is something to be cherished, particularly, dare I say the scary terms, climate change. Malbec will be a variety that can really withstand a lot of, of pressure, of lack of water, because those roots can go so far. Um... It's 80% Malbec, this one. And then it's 20% of a blend of Cabernet Sauvignon, Petit, Verdot, Tempranillo and Syrah. So much more intense grape varieties. We've not got that light Cabernet Franc touch anymore. We've gone for a much more dense uh, grape variety. Slightly lower in altitude. And to go back to where this one is, I've mentioned it before, but the Consulta vineyard here. Um, so Consulta Vineyard is, is ever so slightly lower in elevation. Uh, well, is the Consulta, 
mini area <laughs> within. So the vineyard is Tomal within Consulta on the border of um, Altamira, within Tunian, within the Uco Valley, within Mendoza. So we're now talking about proper crew level. I can taste wine and I want to specifically call out, um, I can taste wine. I can taste wine with a sense of place. Um, they harvest this one slightly more quickly. So over a week and the grape berries are tiny, tiny, tiny. They have amazing concentration. Um, they do use a little bit of whole bunch, less than the other wines. So it's usually around 40%. And they still do their manual punch down, still at low temperature, but they then take 15 months in oak, uh, French oak. And again, 15% is new. So on the nose already, I'm getting a completely different nose. Um, it's much more black fruits, still got a touch of that graphite, but now it's kind of like an earthy, almost meaty. Um, it's less floral. It's more hearty. It's taking, oh, I have had this one only open about an hour and a half, but I think um, this is smelling to me, dare I say it, and I shouldn't, but this is smelling like a really good, fruity Bordeaux to me now um, and it would be a really good one to show friends who loved Cabernet Sauvignon because Malbec often gets compared to Merlot because of the softness of tannins but when you've got this depth of flavour from those tiny tiny concentrated berries here in this vineyard when you've got that I think it moves far more over to the Cabernet than the Merlot world I don't think you could give me that and I'd have told you it was a Merlot. I think if I was going to guess another international variety, it would have been Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, mm. Really high acidity, but balanced by much kind of higher, more structured tannin. Here, they're quite chalky. They still have that classic Malbec smoothness and roundness, but they've definitely got a chalkier element to them. A bit more earthy. Uh, less silky than the first and the real clincher for me is that it's kind of sinewy sinewy texture which is so attractive it's absolutely beautiful and um, and we talked about lamb for the first wine of the pair this is for me where you start to get into the beef territory my mouth is salivating Keith said I agree very like a left bank Bordeaux before it developed the earthiness yes absolutely I think I think Left Bank Bordeaux, you know, Cabernets from, from Napa have this similar quality, this really, really intense blackness of fruit. And that kind of um, the sort of, uh, uh, what am I trying to say? Pouillac, Pouillac vibe of, of iron fist in a velvet glove that everybody says is the phrase for describing excellent Pouillac from the Left Bank of Bordeaux. This is for me, iron fist in a velvet glove. It feels strangely because it's not, but it feels like the alcohol is higher, I think, just purely because the body is so rich. Um, and it's really, whoo, it's intense. I love it. <laughs> so enjoy that. Please keep swirling. And I'll just tell you a couple more bits about some other famous regions. Um, and I'll also tell you about why, why this is so important in Malbec. Um, there have been some tests done. Again, this was a test through the Katena Institute tests done where they tested 23 sites over three years so they didn't just do one vintage because it's not good enough they did here we go 23 sites tested over three years and they tested 26 27 sorry 2016 2017 and 18 vintages it's the largest study of this sort ever done and they tested the difference between the phenolic composition and the climate and terroir of these different sites and the results showed that uh, if members are interested, I can send you a link to the paper because it's open source and it is fascinating. I've been reading and genning up on it for MW studying. But I just pulled this out because I suppose what you what's harder to unpick here without reading the whole study, but it just shows the length. And this is a heat map um, showing relationship correlation. And what they could prove is that sensory analysis showed that you can taste and distinguish between these different sites. Not always and not for all areas. So the Uco Valley ones had strongest, stronger distinguishable um, um, feelings. So that's where you start to get into the red zones. But there were specific sites that you physically could taste through sensory analysis. Um, it's a fascinating study. So I encourage anyone to who's really keen to get into that. Um, and that's the story of the new world of Malbec. Sight is what is going to matter. Terroir is what matters in the world of New Malbec. 
Um, so let's talk about probably the most famous, probably the most famous, I should say, uh, spot in Mendoza. So up here, we've got Uco Valley again, but here we're going to the Tupangato sub-region. It's not quite what its name is. <laughs> and this section here is the Gualtelari. It's the coldest spot in Mendoza. It's the highest zone. So um, most of the vineyards in that entire zone of the um, Tupangato are about 1,500 in that department. This one can be as high as 1,600 meters above sea level. It accounts for 1.2% of Mendoza's vineyards. So again, very small and has been made famous by some of the big names uh, that we've already mentioned tonight. It is excellent quality. So the hillsides basically slide down the mountains um, and let loose all of this sandy, rocky soils um, where not very much can survive, but vines can. And it creates very fragrant freshness, but also really plush juice. So floral, lifted, elegant, yes, lots of red fruits, a bit like our first wine, but this quite intense plushness coming from that incredibly, you know, you can't just say high means colder, high means more UV, it gets you those, those changed tannins in the skin of the grape. So it's an incredible vineyard, um, and there are some very, very expensive fine wines made there, I encourage you to seek them out. Um, it would be... Um, Yes, it's a it's a good activity. Catena actually makes some brilliant fine wines from there as well, but there are other producers. So do seek wines out from there if you're really interested in absolute top tier fine wines from Mendoza. Um, I will also mention Vista Flores. Vista Flores is a lovely little region, um, quite famous here because Michel Roland from uh, basic, well, a Frenchman who basically convinced six famous Bordeaux producers to invest here. Uh, to much success, but that's one of the reasons that it's more pronounced on the world stage, should we say. Again, alluvial soils. So you'll often find um, alluvial soils here, lots of sandy loam, lots of stones, all brought down by the river. Uh, about 1,300 metres again, so nice and high. Plums, roses, violets, very similar to that first wine of the pair that we had. Um, it's often the most ripe version, which is quite interesting. And I don't know whether that's all to do with terroir or whether there's some wine making going on there but it is often a very very luscious plush juicy version of Malbec as well oh so I've sort of tried to explain a few of those I think the main ones that really uh I really hate that map let's get rid of it <laughs> but you can see there's a lot of other up-and-coming regions within uh the Uco Valley as well that are less discovered, as well as, and if we go back to oops, our original map, not only do we have, sorry, I should have put one at the end, not only in, sorry, I'm having a nightmare, uh, not only do we have the Uco Valley that we've just talked about at length, the Lujan de Cuyo that we spoke about also at length uh, when we talked about Vinert and the hugging of the Andes and the Western vineyards that's very special, but we also do have San Rafael, which is sort of up and coming region. Um, the quality probably not as good as those other two. And then we have Mendoza proper. Mendoza proper really does hug around the city. Um, it, this produces, dare I say it, some of the more um, entry level beginner Malbecs, the everyday Malbecs, the easy drinking Malbecs. And they're not to be sniffed at by any stretch. But the altitude is more at that 500 meter I mentioned, that lower altitude. You, as is San Rafael, it's at lower altitude. And actually, the thing about San Rafael is there's less good quality Malbec being produced and other varieties are shining. So, in answer to the question that Laura Catena was asked, what next after Malbec? I don't think there is a what's next after Malbec. I think there's what's next with Malbec. And for me, what's next with Malbec are these particular two regions, Luyan de Cuyo and Valle de Uco, being more and more um, studied, researched, understood. And also the grape just getting a greater recognition across the world. I think hopefully some of you that have tasted tonight have seen that Malbec is not your cheap and cheerful option that you have with your big steak. It is 
perfectly capable of standing shoulder to shoulder with some of the finest wines in the world. It can age like our first wine, absolutely beautifully. It can produce a sort of floral light expression that I see some of you are saying is kind of ready to drink now and approachable early. And then it can have this kind of serious, dense, intense, almost Bordelais expression from our um, Tejo, which I totally agree to the members who are discussing it in the chat probably needs another five years to truly shine. It's drinking now if you like this style, but my goodness, would those wines age. So that's it. I've got some questions in the Q&A and I did manage to leave my five minutes at the end, which I never do. So I'm going to pat myself on the back for that. Uh, I whistled through. So I hope members you managed to, to keep up um, because yes, it's been a little bit of a whirlwind. Uh, so White Malbec is the first <laughs> is the first point of discussion. White Malbec um, is essentially, dare I say it, a little bit like white, white Zinfandel. It's a white grape that is made from the Malbec grape variety. So for anybody who's saying, oh, white, I think I saw a couple in the chat saying white Malbec, that's a new variety. Um, no, don't worry, it's not a new variety. Malbec hasn't suddenly morphed. It's that they are producing a white wine from less ripe Malbec grapes. Um, it's an interesting wine. There are some for sale um, around the place. Would I say that it's the future of Malbec? No. Um, there's these three wines for me and others um, are the future of Malbec. This isn't um, this isn't where I would put the future of Malbec. It's white Zinfandel is the only comparable I can think of. White Zinfandel is actually a rosé where they leave the skins on. Really, the white wine made from red wine, the only place producing really good quality of that in the whole world is champagne. So you can make uh, white champagne or, or uh, blanc champagne blanc from noir grapes, so blanc de noir. Um, that's probably the closest thing I can describe in terms of the action and what's actually happening. Is it the good? Is it the same quality? No, absolutely not. Um, if you like your Malbec in its correct form, drink red Malbec. Don't drink white Malbec. <laughs> Try it. Um, and if you like it, of course, enjoy it. But it's definitely not. Um, it's definitely not a wine that needs to be consumed um, white. So a couple of other questions. I have. Oh, bear with me. I've got a message from Mesh. <laughs> uh, ah, he said that to mention that. Uh, Ian said, which of the wine producers using drip irrigation to offset the lack of natural water? That is a great question, Ian. Um, so drip irrigation is permitted in Argentina. It is not frequently used for top quality vines. And I will explain why as simply as possible. The drip irrigation that is available there are new forms of drip irrigation that go under the soils, which are better, but not great. But the drip irrigation that's available in most of Argentina is over soil rather than subsoil. The problem that you get is I mentioned that one of the best things about Malbec was the really, really dense, deep digging roots. And the top quality Malbec, there again have been various studies that show that the best Malbec tends to be those ones with the big exaggerated root systems. Um, if you're using drip irrigation, your roots tend to learn that water will come from the surface and they won't dig down. The joy of Argentina is uh, they've tried all sorts of things. Drip irrigation is possible, but one of the things that they really tried to do as well was flood irrigation. And flood irrigation was cheap. They did it in Chile as well because they were using the meltwater and they basically built all of these contraptions to flood the vineyards. And um, flood irrigation has actually been sort of proven that it might be better <laughs> for the vineyards because at least then it, it dribbles down, essentially. The problem with drip irrigation is it's constant and on the top. So the recommendation, I should say, basically across most fine wine producers in Argentina is not to drip irrigate at all. If you've got old vines of Malbec, you don't need to because they will find that water, especially when you get the more um, limestone patches, not in all the vineyards, but you do, you know, Vista Flores, for example, you can get your vines trained to find that water deep down. So excellent question. I would say um, it can be used in extreme circumstances. Um, but generally, 
it's not used by the top. Um, and then a final question about other producers that I would recommend. So that's a great one to finish on, actually. Uh, so we we had Susanna Balbo's Torontes, if you did the Argentinian introduction last week. Susanna Balbo's Torontes is actually from the same vineyard, pretty much, as Alzaja, the Paraja Altimira. Um, please do, if you haven't tried her, red wines, and we do we did taste a red wine as well. Um, but Susanna Balbo is fantastic. She's sort of the original female winemaker of Argentina. Um, I would definitely try the Catena expensive wines. They are fantastic. There is also another producer I will mention called Mendel. And I'm actually using one of their wines on Thursday. If you're joining me for the Bordeaux blends, Mendel's uh, Unus is a Malbec based Bordeaux blend. Uh, that I will be using and I won't ruin the surprise but a certain family member close to me said it was one of their favorite wines that they've tried recently um, but they also make a really nice mid-range at about 16 pounds uh, they're sort of Mendoza generic uh, which is still a fine wine but not um, not sort of at your super super premium prices um, yeah those would be my main ones uh, so taste taste along vine out make lots of different price points I should say that as well so do try your vine out wines um, at all the different ranges uh, Mendel Malbec 55 obviously vine out that I've, I've already mentioned vine out Susanna Balbo and Catena those would be my top ones if you want to explore a little bit more um, oh and LTU that's a great one that's actually a group of Chilean and Argentinian pals who all got together and made a, a really stonking uh I think they've got one at the Consulta Vineyard. But yes. Oh, final question. One more that's popped into the Q&A and I missed it just before we sign off is how does the wine society, how does the wine society Malbec fit into the Malbec spectrum? So that's the one from last week that I think Julian's referring to. The wine society has two own label Malbecs. So we have the exhibition and then we have the um uh, what's wrong with me? Society's own label. So the exhibition Malbec is uh, quite floral. So I would strongly recommend if you like the middle wine, if you're tasting long tonight, uh, it's not quite as uh, it's not quite as elegant and lifted, but it is only twelve pounds. But it's definitely more on the kind of damson fruit and. It hasn't had too long in barrel. I think it's had less than a year. It's more aromas and floral. Uh, and that's made by Catena. So that's the exhibition Mendoza Malbec. Again, high altitude. Um, so that's the slightly more expensive of the two. The other wine, which is the Society's Argentine, that is more on the dark fruit spectrum. It's kind of your more, it's not really like any of the three today, but it's definitely more on in the style of the third wine, but a much cheaper version it's under nine pounds I think and that one is much more dark fruit brooding but a lot sweeter fruits than the um Tejo that we had today it's a lot kind of friendlier easy drinking and you drink it kind of immediately right. immediately as you buy it you drink it quickly it's not a wine built for aging unlike the Tejo which is much more on that Cabernet structural uh ageability there we go. I'm sorry. I ran over, but it was only with questions. <laughs> um, thank you all so much for coming. I am so excited to enjoy the rest of my wines this evening. If like Keith uh, and a couple of the others in the chat, you wanted to, you think the Tejo could do with a little bit more time in bottle. Remember what I said. The nice thing is sometimes you can tell a good Malbec by leaving it in the glass. Please, if you haven't already poured all your Tejo out, I strongly encourage you to maybe try a bit more tomorrow. I'm going to drink the rest of my Zaha this evening um, alongside my sister. And I'm definitely going to be saving my Tejo um, and probably